the KSM Show. <laughs> oh man, it's always good to be here Friday evenings to hang out with you, man. Show some love to yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm so excited to have him. I think I had him on some years ago, man, but now he's back and he's back with Vim and Vigo, man. He's the only Ghanaian, by the way, the only Ghanaian who has been nominated for a Grammy Award. Show some love for that. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, man, when you get nominated for a Grammy Award, it's a big deal. It means you are at the top of your, your profession. Nothing beats being nominated for a Grammy when you are in music. So I have the only Ghanaian who's been nominated. So in the meantime, are you ready to receive our Grammy nominated sing musician? Yes. Are you ready? Put your hands together. Show some for Rocky Dawune. How are you doing? I'm good, man. Wow. Rocky, have a seat, man. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Thank you very Where much. Where do I start? Yeah. I mean, come on. I just have to say congratulations, man. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I want to start from the top, man. Thank you. How did you feel when you got the news? Who were you called? Were you written to? And well, the, what happened was that, you know, my album, uh, Branches from the Same Tree, that was the previous album. You know, the album had done very well, the charts, you know, it was well received by, you know, all, you know, the critics. And then also it was kind of a crossover album. So it did very well within the reggae world mm. and also within the world music world. And mm. then also the people, all the music aficionados. So we knew there was some kind of momentum with it, mm. but mm. nothing prepares you for waking up in the morning and hearing your phones, all your phones Ringing. going, ringing and wondering, whoa, what's going on? And then, first of all, I take my phone, I turn it on, and it's like, congratulation messages. And I was like, oh, I won the lottery without <laughs> really, like, you know, buying a ticket. Then I see, oh, congratulations for the Grammy. So I, was, I went online immediately. And so then your first, the first time you noticed was people congratulating people you? People congratulating, because, you know, because the other place, like uh, East Coast and all that, yeah. people had already woken up. And so the, the information was already out. Whilst I was in California, yeah, so when I woke yes. up, people had already Heard. sent me messages. So, and then, and then the category too, you know, the reggae category was, I was only the second African to be nominated within that category. So it wow. was not even an easy category for mm. African albums to mm. be able to, you know, to be able to cross over into that sector. So, you know, I, I took a, it took a minute to, for it to sink in. And um, I, there was really a sense of gratitude and a sense of also that the, the, the journey, the musical journey that started off just as a young kid in yeah, Ghana who had a yeah. dream, all of a sudden there mm, was mm. a certain signpost that I could use to say that, okay, this journey had been incredible, yeah. but then right now music aficionados all around the world to agree yeah. that it's been incredible. <laughs> I mean, when I heard about the nomination, I yeah. was so excited, you know. And I was telling people, I said, listen, even if I'm not nominated, but I hear that they considered me for nomination, crap, I'll be happy. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Wow. <laughs> That's a big freaking deal, man. Yeah, yeah, it was, you know. And then the opportunity to right now, you know, have even everywhere you, I go right now, you know, even within the UN world that I in, the music world, within everywhere you go, you know, you're designate, you know, when you go before mm -hmm. they announce your name, mm -hmm. Grammy nominated artists, you know, and every country, yeah. when I step in there yeah. with that, it's all already right to the top. You know, there is that respect because they know that peers from around the world have all agreed that there's a certain level of ex excellence to your craft and mm -hmm. everybody respects mm -hmm. that standard, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for me too, it, it's also a testament to the journey of Ghanaian music in general because during, you know, when I was nominated, you know, a lot of the press that I did, mm. I tried to shift the focus from me as a person mm. because I feel that I'm a product of a scene and I'm a product of a journey of mm. certain great artists you know, who started right here in Ghana. Because my dream of being a musician was inspired by 
when I was a little kid, like listening to Nanam Pedus and oh, all wow. the wow. high life music wow. that mm, inspired mm, me. Mm. So I can't go all the way and evolve myself to that level without acknowledging that. Where, where it started. Where, they, where it started. So those were my stepping stones and the steps that, you know, so I see that the Grammy nomination, first of all, has opened the way for a lot of Ghanaian, new Ghanaian artists who are coming because right now. you've created the attention. Attention. You know, that you know, Ghanaian music yeah, has arrived. It's on, it's on the radar now. It's on the radar now. So every Ghanaian release, now the Academy voters are taking a second look at it. And at the same time, too, I feel that it's also paying homage to all our greats, too, who worked very hard and created great standards mm. that inspired artists mm. like me mm. to, to be able to equip myself artistically with that mm. and make it to that level, mm. you know. <laughs> How did it all start, man? Did I read somewhere that you do? Wait, did you grow up in uh, Myanmar camp or something? Michel camp. Michel camp in Tema. Yeah. In Tema. In Tema. Yeah. And yeah. you had the soldiers play some Bob Ma that What I read was that yes. Yeah. So, so the whole thing was that my father uh, was the last born. Uh, he came from a traditional royal family in Bumbonayili in northern region, okay. right next to Yendi, about ninety miles from Yendi. But he was the last born of his family, so. He knew that the chieftaincy was something that was just far off for him. So he left, moved to the south, joined the Ghana army. So me, the whole family was born there. I was mm. born in Michel Camp. Oh, you were born in Michel Camp? Yeah, I was born in Michel Camp. Mm. You know? So till I was 12 years, I didn't even know anything apart from Barak's life. Wow. You know, I was like a disciplined soldier <laughs> boy, you know. So, so you're living there with both parents? Yeah, both parents. Okay. So my mom and my dad okay. and then all my siblings, okay. you know. So growing up, and that was also during the time of the Jerry Rollins, you know, era, the coup era. And, you know, so the, the barracks was just a vibrant yeah. place of, you know, yeah. just activism. Yeah. Soldiers were mm -hmm. talking about leadership. Soldiers mm -hmm. were talking about mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. You know, the soldiers were traveling to Middle East and coming back with new music. And at the same time, too, we had this incredible... A band in the barracks called Hot Barrels, obviously. Hot Barrels. Barrels, you know, <laughs> Hot Barrels of... Uh, that was a military band. That was a military band. Okay. So Hot Barrels was really the first... When it, when it comes to a band that really inspired me for the first time, Hot Barrels hot were barrels. my first love. And then I also remember the lead singer, Mingle, Julius Mingle, was actually my the first front man that I saw that I was like, I wanted to be like this guy. Wow. You know, wow. and... Every How all old of the were you then? You're talking like oh, I'll say like five. Wow, yeah, like okay. Actually, I'll, I'll say seven years. You know, okay. yeah, seven okay. years. Okay. Yeah, okay. you know. Okay. So I will go into whenever they are rehearsing. I will go sit in the corner. They wouldn't even know I was there. Yes, I would just yeah observe, listening, and then. I remember they were rehearsing like reggae, you know, like a, it was a Bob Marley album. Mm. I, I, the song was coming in from the cold. Okay. I remember okay. the song up till now. And that was your first time hearing it? That was the first time hearing it. I hadn't heard the origin. So I heard okay. them like sing this song, you know, but the, the, the melodies and stuff, I was like, what is this? You know, so they were going over it and over and over and over. And then later on, I, I you know, I went home. And I found out that, okay, that was a Bob Marley song. So I started, and I knew of Bob Marley, mm -hmm. but it wasn't some, you know, it wasn't a name that, that was, I had, I had yeah, followed, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I started like reading. What was it about the song? Was it the lyrics? Was it the, what there was, was It was coming? just something about the song. There was a certain magic about the song, you know, that I just felt. It felt kind of, it resonated with me mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And by then too, you know, to, to, to go back, I, had, I was already in music. Mm. You know, I was already, I already knew that naturally I was attracted to melodies. To yeah. You know, I was yeah. attracted to everywhere I heard music, I just went to it. Mm. You know, mm. so I, I had that natural propensity mm. towards it. Mm. But then this was something, this was something that all of a sudden opened a certain, you know, kind of vision in me and said, I could do this, I understand this. I love reggae music, so I started really, and all of a sudden I knew that, oh, I had heard all of, you know, Bob Marley's song, you know, but this was a song that made me pay attention. And then, obviously, Peter Tosh and, you know, Fela Kuti and, you know, all the, all the, the other mm -hmm. music that was mm -hmm. kind of happening in the barracks. And the soldiers were traveling also in the Middle East and bringing new albums. So, a lot of the albums that you don't even hear around in Ghana were being brought in because they were traveling outside and bringing it in. So, it was kind of an a little kind of ecosystem and petri dish of culture and music and politics. 
And wow. I think that was what really seeded me. And by the time I came out of the barracks, when I went to my first year in uh, secondary school, which, you know, was? which was Tamale Secondary. Tamale, okay. By the time I left the barracks and went into you know, real life, I had already kind of formulated a certain character. You know, I was musical, I was into activism, I was into uh, a certain level of uh, uh, political consciousness because of the military's yeah, dabbling the in, whole in environment. politics. The whole yeah. environment. And then at the same time, too, I had formulated a certain character, too, of you know, elevating not only my voice, but letting my voice become an instrument to elevate others. So those were all kind of building what, blocks. What, what, you know. what was the first music that you did, the very, your, your creation, when you sat down to, how old were you and, and what inspired that first music that you wrote? The first song that I remember really writing, it was, you know, this is something that I don't tell people a lot. I, apart from being interested in music, I was also very interested in religion. So I literally joined every church. Hmm. You know, I was, you know, I, in the barracks, you know, I joined the Catholic church, catechism. Next door to us, I had, there was a soldier who was a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. So I would join his Buddhist wow. services all wow. the time. And then there was a Presbyterian church. I would go there. My dad's, uh, what's it called? Uh, his family was Muslim. I would double in wow. Islam. Wow. I bought a Bible, read it from beginning to the mm -hmm. end. You know, and I was just into all. So the first. What was causing that? Where, where do you think that it, was? It was? It was just this um, zeal to mm. learn and know mm. and understand the world. And not mm. only understand the world in, in, in a little way, but understand its entirety, understand religion, mm. understand what. Because I was seeing all. And at the barracks, so you had all the tribes too mm. there. Mm. So there was mm. every tribe was there. So I was learning the language wow. from every tribe, the wow. cultures, and every and you, know, and, and you know some you know the Nzima, you know you find the Nzima soldier, you find the Dagumba soldier, you find the Sisala soldier, you find the Gan soldier. Everybody was there, and they, all the children were all our friends. So, so we so there was like a world of multicultural, yes. multi-religious, multi you know musical politics and everything. And, and you were absorbing and every I was just aspect absorbing of it. All of it. And I was curious too. So I wasn't only absorbing it as a passive, you know, uh, person absorbing it. I was actively. absorbing it and actively trying to figure out, you know, ask questions, you know, reading the Bible, you know, you know, and then, there was, you know, one of our, I didn't read the Bhagavad Gita till I was in uh, secondary school when uh, my religi re religious teacher, one day whilst he was teaching, we were having like a a class and he mentioned that oh he even has a copy of the Bhagavad Gita which is the Indian holy book the following day I was at his house to read to, to read to yeah to get a copy and wow. he's like <laughs> and he handed it to me and I went and read it you know wow. because wow. I didn't want the interpretation of any kind of religion to be from another voice because most of the time people who don't understand things condemn it because they don't understand it exactly and I felt exactly. that if I wanted to be the kind of musician and the kind of personality that I envisioned myself being, I knew there was a preparation, preparation period. Deep. And I was using that time to, to learn and equip myself with. So even, you know, recently I did a big concert in, uh, in India and um, we, we played the Nehru Stadium, actually. Wow. And that concert was also dedicated to uh, the Lord Shiva. And a lot of the Indian press were, you know, you know, when they came to speak to me and I started talking and, I, you know, they found like my deep knowledge of wow. their culture. A lot wow. of people were very, very surprised. Wow. I mean, I was in India five times uh, last year touring and playing concerts and collaborating with a lot of top musicians wow. over there, you know. So that has come to really serve me very well. I have a very deep understanding of Islam because my family, my father was... Uh, Muslim, my mom was Christian, and everybody else took their own path in our family. Everybody <laughs> passed their own way, you know. And, and, and my parents were that comfortable to yeah, allow us... Allow you to explore. Yeah, to explore. Be, to be whatever to be, you wanted yeah, to be. Because if yeah. we perceive God as creating man in his own image, then every manifestation of God is valid. You know, and, and it doesn't... You know, if, if you take a plant, a flower, and you have one species, by the time you admire that species, you find that there's many different styles of that same flower spread all around, you know. So I think that in nature, even, we find the nature of God because it's all a reflection. So I try to let that lead me. I think that pluralistic yeah. perception of yeah. the world has served me very well. And also to this day where 
I've been fortunate to also collaborate with organizations like the United Nations mm -hmm. and be a UN mm -hmm. ambassador mm -hmm. and worked in all these levels of, you know, collaborating with world leaders. And, you know, so it, it's really served me very well. And I think all those early ages of preparing, I never even knew the value wow. till right now wow. that, wow. you know, it's really serving me. <laughs> That's intense, man. That's intense. Um, and so I'll go back. So you're, you're, we're, we're, I was asking about the first time you wrote anything oh, yes. down. Yeah. Yes. So after all this, and I remember I, they used to, we used to go to the Catholic church in Tema. So I, I joined, you know, I was like doing the catechism stuff, you know, so they would come every day, the military bus uh, truck would take us from Sundays and then take us to Tema for the, church, the service and, and bring us back. So whilst I was there, you know, I was like watching the choir, you know, sing and all that. So one day when I came home, I was like, you know, I could make this, I could create my own music, you know. Mm. So, and I had been playing with melodies and all of a sudden I just made a song up. So the following day when I was in school, I called some of my friends and said, you know, I heard this song on radio. Listen if you like it. <laughs> so I sang it. I was like, wow, well, yeah. It's a nice song. Hey, it's a nice song. And <laughs> so all of a sudden, the smile came up without telling them. That, that is your some, own music. It's my own music. So that was the first time that I had, like, made and created. Wait, was there a reason you, you threw it out there? Yeah, the, the like, reason, reason I threw it out there because like, I like, knew. Like it's not yours? Yeah, it was not just because I wanted, I didn't want them to be attached to it. One an affair. Yeah, like affair and said, I heard this on the radio. So that one, you don't have any, <laughs> I, there was no artist attached to it. What do you think? What and I think? sang it. Wow. And then they were all like, oh, wow, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very nice. Like, we're, like, we're, we're young kids. <laughs> they really liked it. So then I knew that. You had what, it. Yeah, I had it. You know, like my <laughs> ability to distill melodies from what I was influenced by and what I came into contact with could be translated and appreciated so that was what that exercise really mm -hmm. showed me mm -hmm. so then it also uh validated my self-confidence too i mean i've already built that mm -hmm. you know but then mm -hmm. i knew that i could go and do this and do this on my own terms regardless of what wow. anybody said wow yeah. wow deep man deep, deep. <laughs> <laughs> now so prof turning music into a profession started when well, you know, when I started, you know, I was the noisiest guy in school. When I went to Form 1, you know, everybody, hey, this Dauni boy, can he shut up? You know, in my, in my dormitory, you know, me and my friends who were into music, you know, we used tins and stuff and we start playing and it was like the liveliest. Yeah. So in the evening yeah. after classes, people will come there because we'll be making up songs, yeah. singing covers and dancing. So it was kind of, you know... And, and, and it was always in my mind. So at that time, you know, me and my friends, my main vision was that I was going to finish Form 5 and I'll start my musical career. Mm. So once in, I was in Tamale and then after Form 5, I qualified for Sixth Form. You know, the funds were not there. You know, I wanted to buy my first guitar. I did not find my first guitar, money to buy my first guitar. So afterwards, you know, I moved back home. And by then, we had, my father had moved to Koforidia, mm. you know, from the army to Koforidia. So Koforidia was the base. So in Koforidia, I, uh, I started, I went to uh, a new job in secondary commercial for my sixth form. So whilst in new job, same thing. I brought the same thing there. Everybody... Love, you know, my place will be singing. So I started even tagging all the walls, Rocky Dawuni and the Rhythm Ravers, because that was my I image of what my band was called. Rhythm Ravers. Yes. And even when I, a f few years ago, when I went and I was looking on the wall, I went and found one. Really? In the corner somewhere. And I ran away. I was like, hey, Charlie, I'm going to be paint you now. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is, that, this is that boy, you know. <laughs> so I, you know, I was just into that. And then after sixth form, when I was, um, I did my national service and during the national service, I started, I went into a little bit of farming, into vegetable farming mm. because I wanted to raise money mm. to buy my guitar and buy my instruments. So this farm in Koforidia was, you know, I started, it was very successful. I was supplying cabbage and, you know, to all the hotels there. Really? And um, actually, not to even say it, but my, the, the guy that I was also working with a lot, you know, who was also next door neighbor, 
uh, was uh, uh, Dr. James uh, Orleans Lindsay, you know, who also had a cabbage farm. So we grew really? up together. We both had cabbage farm and now he's in real estate and all that, you know. And um, so from there, I also qualified for the University of Ghana. My dreams of buying my equipment still was elusive. I qualified to go to the university and I was like, okay, I'm stopping here with education because the more I become educated, the more I postponed this dream of being a musician. So there was that struggle going on within okay. me. So my older brother too, who is currently the chief of uh, Bumbonayili, at that time he was at Ligon. So he, was, he came back home and I was like, what are you doing in Kofuria? I know you're doing this, your farm and all that, and you're selling it and making some money and you, know, you want to do music, but you, know, you qualify for the university. You sat for A-levels, you qualify to come and study in the university. You should come to the university. I was like, no, because if I come, that would be the end of the dream. And it's like, but have you considered that all the producers that you want to meet, all the artists that you want to meet, everything happens in Accra. So you can't be just a local champion here, you know, in Kofuridria, and, yeah. and be happy with it and think that this thing will start as like, university, probably that's the opportunity. And then university, you become even a better musician. So he was able to make the argument for me. So I thought about it, I was like, okay. So all of a sudden, I closed the farm, got my staff, came to Legon, and the first day I landed in Legon, I went looking for musician and somebody told me oh you know Nat Bruce brother is, is here I was like where you know like oh you know he's in Sabah Hall straight the first day I landed my staff found Yofi Brew you know Yofi Brew I was like oh you know I want to meet your brother you know and Yofi is like oh you know I'm a singer too you know, and you know so we started like chatting and then we yeah. found uh, Kafui Day was also at that time, you yeah, know, they're gone, yeah, you know, so... Yeah. It's scenario. getting exciting, but I'm going to take a commercial break. Yes, So yes, hold it right yeah. there. When we come back, yes. we're going to continue from where we are living. Exactly. Stick around, folks. <laughs> we'll be right back. The KSM Show.